the Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Now we're going to look at the Sunday Papers. I'll run you through the headlines first off. We have the Sunday Independent and... Well, you've got to credo, credit his stubbornness. Uh, Florentino Perez says Super League show will go on. So Perez is not giving up on this. He's talking about binding contracts. He's talking about JP Morgan still very much ready to go when needs be. So uh, Perez says he's adamant, in fact, that the 12 clubs are bound to contracts and the blueprint is very much alive. And then uh, Munster Magic above that. 27 points to three win for Munster against Leinster. Conor Murray had a good evening picture of him there going over for one of his tries. Uh, the Sun then they have hashtag blank holiday weekend. This is uh, Thierry Henry hailing uh, his happiest uh, moment in English football. So next weekend from 3 o'clock Friday through to uh, midnight on the Monday evening. So 11.59 Monday, May 3rd. Every single club will switch off all their social media accounts to protest at the abuse that their uh, players and staff take. And then above that, you have David Moyes head in his hands. He thought the Balbuena sending off was a disgrace. Uh, the star, a uh, picture of Manchester United fans outside Old Trafford, that famous uh, statue of Best and Law and Charlton and Glazers out all over it. Uh, Civil War is the headline. Angry fans protest at clubs again. There was American flags burned outside Old Trafford. And interestingly as well... Smaller uh, side section, FSG turned down three billion cop offer. So it seems an offer has come in to the tune of three billion for uh, Liverpool, which John Henry has said no thank you to. The Mail then, a picture of the Irish team yesterday beating Italy 25 points to five. Much more like it is the headline. And alongside that, Sarah Keane says indoor sport ignored as GEA returns. Shane McGrath here. And she is saying, uh, Sarah Keane, of course, Chief Executive of Swim Ireland, there is a concern. People are thinking, right, the GA is back and the others are back, so sport is sorted. And she is making the point that indoor sport has been left hanging. No sense of a timeline. She said, nobody's looking for anything unrealistic. We are looking for whenever indoors reopen, where we fit into that order, because we can't hear about it on uh, the day and start putting things in place. So they're looking for a bit more notice, which seems... Absolutely fair enough, I would think. Uh, Sunday World, uh, picture of Cavani here, Red Devil. Uh, this is Ole Gunnar Solskjaer saying he feels powerless to uh, stop Edison Cavani from going at the end of the season. Uh, the Mirror also go with that FSG story. A three billion cop bid rejected. So with John uh, Richardson here says that Liverpool owners Fenway Sports have rejected a bid of almost £3 billion for the club. The astonishing offer was made before it was announced that John Henry had been involved in talks over the Super League. And it's understood, you'll be shocked to hear, that the offer has come from the oil-rich Middle East. Um, so that's where we are on Liverpool. And then front page of the Sunday Times, picture of Jurgen Klopp, a one-all draw yesterday against Newcastle. The headline is Super League. We don't even deserve a Champions League spot. So he wasn't best uh, pleased with his team uh, yesterday. So that is where we are on the uh, front pages of the, of the sports sections. Very happy to say Grania McLuhan is with us. Broadcaster with TG Carr, Sky Sports, RTE, Kieran Cunningham as well. Chief sports writer with the Irish Daily Star. Let's start with the Super League coverage, Kieran. Where do you want to go? Um, I have to say, in a way, I was kind of dreading it because there's been... It's been su such a hard week. There's been so much stuff written and said already. Wonder, you know, how much appetite have you to go out again? It has been an extraordinary story. Like, you think this broke um, around 4, 4 p.m. or so, or no, afternoon, some, sometime in the afternoon last Sunday. Effectively, it's dead in the water by Wednesday night. You know, the things progress so quickly. And it's something that Jonathan Northcott in the Sunday Times touches on. Um, in regard to the reaction from players and the, the voice that they had, and he, he quotes an unnamed agent, and they had this, he said, had this stunt been pulled 20 years ago, the players wouldn't be the voice, not, nor would the coaches. The voice came from social media and 24-7 sports reporting. The players of the last generation couldn't have organised themselves in a way that was so effective. And actually, it made me think of the wider point on social media that, you know, sometimes people say, you know, what would have been like if Saipan, Twitter was around when Saipan was there, you know, God, God forbid that it was, but I think this was a story that, in a way, it was killed on social media. It blew up on social media and it was killed because the reaction was so overpoweringly 
overpoweringly negative against it. And it helped people to organize against it. And, you know, I haven't seen any story in a long time that took over timelines so much. You know, there just seemed to be nothing except people's reaction. And there was very few voices in favor of it. And I think straight away, you could see they were really up against it because the opposition, it was clear the opposition that was out there. Yeah, very true. Jonathan Northcroft's uh, piece has lots of interesting background info. And I guess that's the nice thing about a journalist who's had all week to work on this story is they're able to dig into their contacts and find out some things that happened. So, for instance, uh, Mike Gordon, he's the FSG president. He phoned Jordan Henderson on Monday and he said two things. He said, we are absolutely committed to taking the club into the Super League. However, you are free to speak your mind. He said, we're doing this in principle and you have to speak to your principles. So it was interesting. Henderson was told there was no issue with you or the playing staff speaking out. We can presume uh, Klopp was told the same thing. Seems uh, playing and coaching staffs were not told until the weekend this broke. Uh, one reason keep, for keeping them in the dark, says Northcroft, was plausible deniability. In which, they, 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 in which case they could, like Klopp did on Monday, turn to fans and say, nothing to do with us. We didn't know a thing about it. Uh, there's a PR person uh, who was in the uh, Zoom call between the Big 12 on the Friday and they were talking about their communications strategy and somebody described it as a sketch on the back of a fag packet strategy. Is, uh, <laughs> and that seems about right. And then uh, one other point as well is that Jordan Henderson... So at 9 o'clock Tuesday, all the Liverpool players posted the same social media post. We don't like it, we don't want it to happen. Their action was led by Henderson. They had wanted to go earlier in the day, but he wanted to wait until everybody came back to him on WhatsApp. But interestingly, he had also been onto the Premier League captains as well via that same WhatsApp group that had been set up during the COVID lockdown when they were talking about Project Restart and the NHS Together movement and everything. And it turns out all the Premier League captains were set to speak out on Wednesday. Now, obviously, this thing fell by the wayside Tuesday evening, but uh, Henderson, it seemed, had taken charge there as well. And the captains were ready to come out. So really interesting stuff there in Northcroft's piece in the Sunday Times. Grania, what caught your eye? Yeah, I, I think on that, Joe, and the, I mean, this story was unbelievable. I don't remember watching a game for so much and actually just waiting to hear what Jurgen Klopp had to say before the, the Leeds-Liverpool game last Monday. Um, and, and what's interesting, like this has been from what we're reading and hearing has been in the making for the last three years, the Super League, yet how poorly it was executed. Like it's actually unbelievable that you would actually go ahead and do something like this without really consulting your players and your management teams and then just put everyone out there and go off you go. I, I just can't believe how badly PR exercise was done. It was interesting in that piece, I think someone that you, you referenced there, Joe, that they actually walked away from it because it was so badly organized. So you think if you're planning something for three years, you actually would execute it at, at, a, at the correct time as well, like not just during the day when the Premier League games are about to kick off and suddenly, my God, every TV, every broadcaster wants to find out a reaction from players and from management. But what's also inter interesting as well is that, and um, Kieran just referenced it there, the whole Twitter and social media, like there's there's kind of like a shift as well, you know, definitely the fans coming out was, were important, but I also think players coming out and the power that they have on social media, like in that in that Jonathan Northcroft um, piece, which I find really good, like Marcus Rashford, he tweeted um, an epitaph from Sir Matt Busby about how football is about supporters and not money, and it gained more than half a million likes, mm. which for context here would have made it the second most popular tweet from a UK feed in 2020. So we're talking about player power here, like Jordan Henderson, they have the resources with that WhatsApp group that they put together that you referenced as well. But when it says here as well in, in Jonathan Northcroft's piece, when by midnight on Tuesday, Liverpool, United, Arsenal and Tottenham also pulled out of the ESL, it was no surprise Anyone in living in Britain in the past year, never mind worked in football, will tell you that you can never win if Rashford, Guardiola, Henderson, and Raheem Sterling, who tweeted OK bye as the ESL collapsed, are against you. Yeah. So I think it's it's opened up a real the power of social media, but just such a poor executed policy for business people that are involved in making these massive deals to actually that disconnect that you actually think we can go ahead and do this without actually having your main stakeholders about which are your players and your management teams let's face it you know they were so against it and then not to even consult them like it was unbelievable it was so bizarre and such a fascinating story I, I again I can't remember the last time that I've been so captivated and you'd start listening to it at point and by, and half an hour an hour later things had changed and things like Josie Mourinho 
and getting the sack just didn't even come into the equation all week. You know, you just didn't even have time to, de to de decipher that. So lots of pieces with that, Jonathan Offgrave. Again, if you look at the Sunday Indo, Eamon Sweeney as well, and he's taken the, the stint from the fans won't stand for it. And I thought this was a really good piece too because it's kind of saying, well, what the fans are standing for at the moment and in Premier Leagues, it's, you know, they're, they're talking about, you know, turning a blind eye or maybe not just being as as critical of some of the Premier Leagues in terms of owning it, of the regimes that they have and the guilty of human rights violations at home and connected with war crimes abroad, sports so entangled with gambling, season tickets, prices, overpriced replica kits. Um, for example, England's 2018 World Cup um, kit cost £160, was made in Bangladesh by workers paid as little as 21 pence an hour. Um, Eamon Sweeney writes, you know, just it's all about revenue um, despite the millions being lavished on wages and transfer, only five out of the 20 clubs are willing to pay their lowest pa paid staff the real living wage of £9.30 an hour, even though that would require an hourly increase of just 50 pence from the statutory minimum. And you just look at the closed shop. And, and his point as well in this piece um, was that the ESL, in kind of it is a de facto um, Super League in Europe as it is at the stands. He goes through the different teams that are comp competing. In reality, in the Premier League, 72 clubs are competing um, 44 have never played in the Premier League and another seven haven't been there in the last 20 years. Mm. In Europe, um, in Spain, 2003, um, no clubs since then other than Real Madrid, Barcelona, Atletico Madrid have won La Liga. And the same in, in, in Italy. It's Juventus, Inter Milan, AC Milan have been in power there since 2001. Bayern Munich are closing in the ninth title and PSG have won seven of the last eight league titles. So he's just making the point there that, you know, we have kind of like a European Super League as it stands and... And fans, I think, are important, but just also if, and David Walsh in his piece as well, if fans would get so riled up and so um, crust, as they would say, ask Gaelic and Irish about the, <clears throat> about racism, we'd actually might see a very a, a very stronger result happening and, and, and our attitudes towards that. Mm. Kieran, did people did make the point, as Grainne has alluded to, that these clubs were just looking to formalise a reality which has been in existence for some time already? Yeah, without doubt. Uh, like, you can... Like Bayern Munich have been widely praised for for not getting on board with it, you know, and, and the fifty plus one rule in Germany is, is a big part of that. But you could also make the point like that Bayern are about to win, you know, a ninth Bundesliga title in a row. Whenever uh, a serious threat to them emerges, like Borussia Dortmund under Jurgen Klopp, they basically fill out the club and take the best players, like they took Lewandowski. Mm. So the status quo suits them, you know. The status quo suits a lot of clubs. So. Um, like, there's been a lot of nonsense around this. Like, I listened to Five Live yesterday after Liverpool's draw with Newcastle. And Chris Sutton was on and Rory Smith of the New York Times. And Chris Sutton was saying, you know, going with this kind of stuff again, that this shows we don't need a Super League. This shows the Premier League is the greatest in the world. You know, that, you know, you, you, Liverpool weren't able to the reigning champions. They couldn't be hold on against Newcastle. And Rory Smith had to make the very, very valid point that you get 1-1 one, one draws in every level of the game with late equalisers against the team that dominated for most of the game and did most of the chances. You know, you can't uh, extrapolate some wider point out of that. And the reality is that um, the, 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 the teams that are, uh, the, t the six English teams that wanted to break the way, if, if a team outside that in the next 30 years wins the league, I'd be very surprised. I think the only option is possibly Leicester City. Mm -hmm. I can't see anybody else winning it. Like the, the reality is those are the teams with the money and the power and uh, I think it's um, somebody talks about being in Ethiopia. Uh, uh, Jonathan Wilson. The, Jonathan Wilson. Yeah, and about how twenty percent of the village he was in were watching the Premier League, and that goes into the sales of Premier League. The Premier League sell, has TV deals worldwide because of Liverpool and Manchester United. It's not even City or Chelsea at the moment because they have, they've been their success is more recent. They haven't built up a global power base yet. Mm. But if you take Liverpool and United out of those TV deals, how many people would want to buy them? And even the, so, that's the way where those clubs are coming from. That's night Sheffield United against Brighton was shown on TV. I guarantee you, the figures with that, for that would have been dismal. Like most people who buy the Sky packages, the BT packages, etc., they're only buying to watch the big clubs. And I think this is what these clubs were looking at, and it will be the future TV deals, that you will buy a deal to watch Liverpool games or United games or City games or whatever. That the general package, like most people, I know Burnley keep being thrown into it for some reason. Most people don't want to watch Burnley games other than Burnley fans. That's, that's reality. So, uh, 
you know, Bill Kenwright is an interest, like this Bill Kenwright in the, in the mail, he's an interview with Oliver Holt, Holt and he's one of the old style fan owners, you know, and he goes into his history of being a fan, you know, and it, it, there's a lot of nice stories, like you get on a train from London and people will be coming on at different places, like from Crewe or Rochdale or Bury or Gillingham, and they were all going to watch those teams, you know, and that was that's what he grew up with. But I also think, like, even if they'd done it in a different way, if they had Super League 2 with relegation uh, or promotion and relegation to the top tier European Super League, mm. and they'd approached teams like Everton and Leicester and West Ham, would they have turned them down? I'm not so sure they would have. Mm. Like, I think that a lot of this is disgruntlement of it being excluded. If they were told you have a way into the Super League, would these clubs have been so dead against it? Well, Bill swears they would have said no, so... <laughs> yeah. Bill might look usual. I'm not so sure about some of the other owners. You know, you look at Leicester City's owners. They have said no. Not yeah. so sure. Yeah, I'm not so sure either. Uh, you mentioned Jonathan Wilson's piece there. It's, uh, I think, a really good overview of what's been going on here. So he says, this is in The Observer, it's also in The Sunday Independent, uh, conditions that provoke the attempted coup are not gone. So he says this week it was the, um, you know, potentially the biggest rupture in European football since 1885 when professionalism came in. And he says, having come so close, it feels remarkable it's taken so long for a model that is accepted elsewhere, crickets, IPL, rugby union, super rugby, all major US sports, etc., to become a serious possibility in English football. Uh, and he says, of the super clubs, they're in two factions, and this gets to the heart of the point. They're in two factions. There are those whose wealth is derived predominantly from football and there are those who might be termed the Petro Clubs, whose external resources mean they can easily ride out a couple of disappointing years on the pitch. Uh, he says the Super League feels the natural consequence of neoliberal economics that looks at football as purely a generator of revenue and ignores its social function. And he talks about various things, you know. In uh, 1981, the English FA lifted a ban on director remuneration. 1992, the Premier League, that solidated the elite. Talks about things like the 1987-88 European Cup, Napoli versus Real Madrid, the champions of Italy against Spain in the very first round. Club executives saw this as an unconscionable reduction in the number of marketable games, hence the change in the Champions League. But he does say things like English football, league attendances are higher than they've been at any stage, really, over the last 60-odd years. However, the match-going fans, who 30 years ago were so important to clubs' finances, are now uh, no longer the primary source of revenue. It's about globalisation and the point you make about Ethiopia watching these games. He concludes by saying, if you're, uh, like Florentino Perez is, if you're declaring an economic crisis at a time when football is watched by more people than ever before, maybe the issue is less the football and more the business. This is the paradox. By the logic of the market, shouldn't the clubs who cannot thrive in such circumstances be allowed to fail? Has Florentino Perez ever considered just not spending so much? And that is the point here, Grania, that the more traditionally funded clubs are looking at PSG and Man City and I suppose to an extent Chelsea and they can't keep up. They have to strike now because they can't keep up. Well, they, they can't afford to buy these players. Like the, the wages are just astronomical that some of these clubs are able to play players. But I just want to just, and just continue in that, on yeah. that vein off that that he just mentioned, and just to come in as well, just on on Graham Sooney's just Sooney's had a piece just underneath um, Jonathan Northcroft's in the Sunday Times, and I just find it interesting in that. You know, I, I wonder in 20 years' time will people look back and go, that was a missed opportunity um, because, you know, we're living at at the moment and people at the time when the Premier League was changing or when Sky Sports got involved, people were outraged about that too, going, gosh, are, you know, are we selling our soul, etc. But Graham Soonies is talking about trust in the game and, and just interesting in that, you know, he's talking about tr the traditional fan in that, you know, um, they, um, they fail to grasp that the guy who buys a season ticket or girl probably sits in the same seat his dad did and beyond that possibly his grandfather too they didn't understand that our clubs are institutions to supporters and not just another exporting franchise but I think the data as as Kieran was saying like we're seeing 20% of people watching this in Ethiopia it's becoming a global fan and I heard different reports on, on your program and during the week as well it was you know if Anfield was empty tomorrow morning you would have people coming from all around the world that want to go and experience that that game so I think it's getting more into a global fan and and Sunnis also mentions as well that the motive for the Super League as we all know was money and new markets Europe has less than 10% of the world's population Asia has 60% 
and that's what they're targeting. So, you know, the fans, the traditional fans are really important, but I think with that disconnect with owners coming in that aren't English, that aren't that, that, that possibly aren't involved in the club because of wanting a footballer there because of money. They don't see that connect as important as it would have been years ago. So that um, there's a disconnect there as well and a value chain that's changing as well on what a traditional fan is. So you have fans that want to be fit to get um, Haaland and, and Mbappe. But who's going to pay for them? Like, where's that money going to come from? And they want owners that have lots and lots of money. Mm. And if they have clubs that are just run very sparsely, as for example, Arsenal under Wenger might have been very, very, you know, they were there or thereabouts. They were never going to win anything, but they stayed in the Premier League. But fans got frustrated because they want to win cups. They want to win titles. So who is going to pay this money for them? And that comes from broadcast rights. That comes from wealthy owners. And that's what we're seeing. So you're seeing these wealthy owners going, well, hang on a second, we... We want a Super League. We want to make money because the game is changing. But that's a different... You have to flip that in your head. Are we paying too much money to all these players? You know, if everyone wants a fair, um, equitable society and a retribution of success, well, then you basically have to um, redistribute the funds and how are we going to do that? So I think that's an interesting topic that needs to be explored as well. And when it comes to it, do fans really want that? Do they want to be staying in the Premier League and just be there or thereabouts? Or do they actually want to push for it? Um, and I know everyone's talking about Leicester and that was a brilliant, brilliant performance by Leicester. But how many teams realistically are going to do that over the next 10 years? Mm. There is um, one very good piece by John Carlin, I thought, on Florentino Perez. And he makes the point, you know, Perez has been accused of being deluded and tone deaf. And that's certainly true. But Carlin does point out this guy's no fool. In many ways, he's the most impressive of all the club chairmen. And I think that is very true. I'm going to come to a Neil Francis piece in a minute because he just uh, points out how rugby really needs to watch what's going on in a big way. But a point I'd probably disagree with Neil, he's talking about how smart a lot of these people are at the top of these clubs. And I'm not sure that fully stands up to certain scrutiny. You've got a lot of not self-made men here. You've got the Glazers, who are just heirs to a fortune. You've got Stan Kroenke, who married into his fortune. Sheikh Mansour, I don't think we could describe him as a self-made man. And Yeli, again, just inherited his family's situation. Like, the, you know, of the 12, pretty quickly, you're getting into people who might mistake their good fortune in life for a great intelligence and based on the effort to execute this thing, there are probably legitimate questions about the intelligence in places. But Perez is no fool. And like this guy has, has done a remarkable thing. He is absolutely self-made. He has got into, well, he's a qualified engineer, but his construction uh, conglomerate, it turns over 100 million euros a day. 100 million a day, employs 200,000 people in 60 countries. He's built tunnels, bridges, roads, railway lines right across the world. Uh, Carlin says his blind spot is Real Madrid. He's been a fan since he was five. Uh, he absolutely adores this club. Everything I do, he said, is for the good of football. Carlin says, translation, everything I do is for the good of Real Madrid. So he has tunnel vision. And he says, Carlin, that is, the author, he says, the word greed has been thrown at Perez. He said, that may not be quite be accurate here. This is about survival. He says survival is the better word. He says the income ba gap between the Premier League and La Liga yawns wider with every season. The quality gap too. Uh, Madrid you know, to compete is only going to become more difficult over time. It's the same for Juan Laporta at Barcelona. So he uh, writes, Carlin, the six English clubs caved in at the first sign of resistance because for them the project was indeed about winning a few more dollars, not the fear of financial ruin. And he says of uh, Perez, he's humbled and humiliated and obliged to endure the sneers. But the point is, Kieran, he's coming back. I mean, he's, he's <laughs> when, when the, on the front page of the Sunday Independent where he's going on about um, binding contracts and you could say making a holy show of himself, it's out of desperation. This isn't a, like the greed point applies to some. I'm not sure it actually does apply to Perez here. No, because it reflects Real Madrid's situation with their massive debts. And this was his way. This was, I think he, saw, he sees this as the only way out of that. And, uh, you know, it is telling. Like, you look at the fan protests in England, there haven't been anything like fan protests, uh, similar fan protests in Spain, yeah. you know, because uh, the, the Barcelona and Real Madrid fans recognize that the clubs are in big trouble. Like, I think it's interesting when you look at England, like the clubs that were said to be a bit more wary but get into this and who were quickest to turn were Chelsea and Manchester City. And I think that's a reflection of the money they've got behind them. Like, no club has ever spent 
on the scale of City over the last 10 years. Last summer alone, Chelsea spent nearly 300 million euro. So they have massive money, you know, behind them. Whereas <clears throat> the likes of Liverpool don't, you know. Liverpool, you know, uh, their last four transfer windows have been net spend of 30 million. Their wage, their wage bill though, was massive. It's bigger than Bayern Munich's. And they need, uh, like they're in a bind now because if they miss out in Champions League football, combined with the hit they've taken of COVID, that a lot of uh, a lot of clubs that were going on to this weren't coming from the same base. Some were looking at it as was something they'd like to do, but others are, are doing it out of desperation. And I think also out of weariness that they they think they pay for the rest, that they're the people who finance the TV deals for the rest, etc. And also, I think you're going to see a reaction against UEFA and FIFA, that they're being seen in some way as a saviour of the game over this. But FIFA makes $6 billion from the World Cup. Mm. And how much do they give back to the clubs who produce, you know, who provide them with the players to play at those World Cups? They give back very little. You know, FIFA is a money-making machine. So I think there is going to be more pressure on governing bodies to spread the wealth around after it. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I yeah, I don't think, though, a lot of people are saying this is going to be a sea change and that we're going to see more fan power and the 50 plus one model come to Ger no. uh, England. I don't see that happening. I don't. I, I, don't I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. There's no chance that's going to happen. I mean, you don't become a billionaire by being shaken easily, I suspect, or making... Uh, easy decisions. Uh, Neil Francis is, is predominantly talking about rugby here, but uh, it's interesting, his take on the last week. He says the only winners last week were the owners. He said they did have to apologise to their fans, but apologies come cheap. And he says that the boys were jockeying for position and leverage. In a PR stunt like this, they've managed to wield enormous power, exert their influence and spread fear in one fell swoop. It's a master stroke. And he thinks going forward now that whenever there's a negative response to what they're requesting. All they'll have to do is say Super League. Uh, how meekly did the whole thing fold? Do the good guys really think that a few hundred supporters chanting outside Premier League grounds had any effect? What notice did the owners take of all those people who got involved or Boris? Um, yeah, I wonder. See, I sort of think their own staff ambushed them in a big way. I also don't think the English clubs were that committed. Like Spurs and Arsenal just thrilled to be asked and going along with the crowd. They don't have any real leverage. Uh, Sheikh Mansour and Roman Abramovich did not really need this. The status quo suits them fine. I think they were very lukewarm. And suddenly you're just left with Manchester United and Liverpool driving this thing. And I don't. I think Henry is genuinely uh, more under the thumb, too strong a way of putting it, of, of Liverpool fans than we might be realising here. I mean, there is kind of special fan base and... I think that just leaves the Glazers as those who don't give a damn. So I, I really think this has backfired. I don't think it was a masterstroke at all. But anyway, look, he could well be right, Neil Francis, down the line. But what's really interesting, he talks about rugby. So he, there's, it's, it's, it, this had all passed me by that all this stuff is going on. Uh, Darren Childs has left his post as CEO of Premiership Rugby. Uh, Neil Francis says that wouldn't have garnered any headlines. He's just a faceless bureaucrat who in 19 months in charge has done, well, not very much is what Neil says. Uh, what's pertinent now, though, is where he's going. Childs has taken up a consulting post with CVC, who have bought 14% of the Six Nations. Ordinarily, this is not of huge importance. But there are so many gamekeepers turning into poachers, it's hard to keep track. Mark McCafferty went from Premiership to CVC. Ian Ritchie went from RFU to Premiership. And Childs has now gone to CVC. He says, I can't help uh, but thinking there's more than this is just a great fit for all parties. It happens in business all the time where key executive transfer to rivals and there's nothing you can do about it but in this instance the damage that can be done with insider knowledge is considerable people with I, I suppose as Neil says insider knowledge of how the game uh, works um, thought that was pretty interesting the genie is out of the bottle is the headline so that was a, a slightly different take on the week that was any final point anyone wants to make on, of, on the European Super League I never want to talk about this again certainly not until uh, tomorrow but just one thing I think there's some people have been overpraised. Like, like there was a bit. I thought, you know, Gary Neville made a lot of good points, but there's an element of grandstanding to it as well. And also, you know, you do look at what he's done with Salford City and the other owners. You do look at his lack of criticism of the Glazers up, up to this week. Like he often name checked Ed Woodward, but never the, the Glazers. And Alex Ferguson was the same. Like Alex Ferguson made a very strong statement this week, but he was manager under the Glazers for eight years. At one stage, he was challenged by supporters at, at an airport in Budapest, and he told them, go and watch Chelsea. 
and he often defended the Glazers, you know, after they put up prices or, you know, mm. ticket prices, etc. So a lot of people now are saying, you know, these are the kind of people to get out of football, they shouldn't be there, but they were happy to work with him for a long time. Well, the other point is, Grania, the Glazers out posters. Imagine it happens. United are going to cost four billion. Mm. What well-intentioned soul is going to take over Manchester United for four billion? Well, you see, this is it, um, and it goes back to my point. I mean, you might like these owners, but you know, look at the grief Ole was under last was it November when things weren't going well, and everybody wanted him out, and there's not enough money to be invested. Um, so, you know, it's it's hard to get it's hard to get um, people that are going to take over and spend an awful lot of money. Um, and we've all outlined the, the the groups that do that, and they're from the Middle East and uh, coming from areas that have lots of money. Maybe don't have the same interest in football. They just enjoy doing it, and they have lots of money to spend. But when they come over as well, they're spending so much money. It's like no other club can actually keep up with that. And just and going back to Graham Sooney's point, yeah. but I just think it's it's pertinent here as well. But just as we were talking about there, like he was saying, like about people being involved at business people as well and that they have acumen for business but maybe their their fatal flaw is actually being involved in in a club and it's just talking about his old chairman david murray rangers who spent tens of millions of his money chasing the dream there and then mike ashley runs newcastle united as he would any of his other businesses and look at how unpopular he is there so it's just uh, i mean is it, is it bad that you have, you know, I don't know, Joe, I mean, if he goes, who comes in in this place, like what, you know, what, I know people are, they're very unlike, likeable, they were the only group that came out and actually gave a reason why they wanted to stay involved mm. in, in the European Super League. But I mean, who who else is going to, what, what funding, what money is going to come in from someone else that's going to pay, pay that and actually add to that and spend more money? I'm, well, not, I'm not sure. Well, at the moment, it's Petro State involved in sports washing or... A venture capitalist who will perform leverage buyout and milk the club for what it's worth. They're your two options at the moment, I would think. So, yeah, we'll take a very short break. We're back with more from Grania and Kieran in one second. Now, you're very welcome back. We have Grania McElwain with us, broadcaster with TG Carr and Sky Sports and RTE. We have Kieran Cunningham. Chief Sports Writer with the Irish Daily Star. We have a bunch of things to try and get through, uh, Kieran. We have Ireland-Italy coverage, the broadcasting deal in GEA, Katie Taylor against an MTK opponent this weekend. There's a very good interview with Michael Ryan, who's been in Hurling and Camogie all his life on the back of his new autobiography. Uh, Sarah Lavin as well, really interesting chat with her. There's a piece on swimming that you wanted to get to. I'll let you take your pick. Uh... I'll just go to swimming first and then we can move on, we can move on quickly because there's a lot to do. But it's a, an interview, a special report by Shane McGrath in the mail. But, uh, you know, the, the main interview in it is with uh, Sarah Keane, CEO of Sport Ireland. She's also president of the Olympic Federation of Ireland, but she's wearing her swimming hat in this. And she, just a few valid points in this. Like, uh, there's, there's scientific, uh, a, a few scientific details on this that, Chlorine in swimming pools kills COVID-19 within 30 seconds. So it's just illustrating, in the know, swimming is quite a safe right. a safe uh, outlet in, in these times. But you know, Sarah Keane says Swim Ireland doesn't own any swimming pools. There are more private swimming pools in this country than there are public-owned swimming pools. We've lost a whole generation of children potentially to the sport of swimming because they haven't been in for over a year. There haven't been swimming lessons. There's been very little to operate uh, with in the last year. There's real concern about whether parents are going to bring their kids back. And I know this. Uh, there's similar sentiments across the board in in indoor sport, because indoor uh, COVID obviously spreads easier uh, in indoors than outdoors. So, and the big sports carry more weight and get most media coverage. Soccer, GA, rugby, golf, uh, horse racing as well. And there's no talk like I know that there's talk like, like this in boxing. There has been talk like this in basketball, and they're very worried about people coming back. And that's the that's the case with the big field sports as well. Like when you break the chain. Mm. You know, will people return the same numbers? But I actually suspect there could be a flip side to this, that a lot of people are dying to get back to it. And even people who, have, who haven't been in sport for a while, now there's been a break and, you know, they're just thinking, you know, what will we do when we get back to it? And I think maybe I would like to go back swimming. Maybe I would like to join a football team or a soccer team or something I haven't played in a few years. So I think it could work both ways. But, you know, there is a strong argument at the moment and, and definite fears 
mm. of, uh, of people being lost to sport. Well, Sarah Keane is asking for what seems to me a very fair point, which is give us some time, give us a roadmap. She said, we're very reasonable. I mentioned this when I was going through the headlines. We're very reasonable, rational people. We understand what COVID has done to society. We're not looking for anything realistic. We're just looking for whenever indoor reopens, where we fit into that order, because we can't hear about it on the day and suddenly start putting things in place. I'd be very hopeful on swimming's part that people will return, not least because it's just deemed in many families a necessary skill. You need to learn how to swim. Not all of us who were dragged to swim pools like swimming as kids, but you just need to learn how to swim. It might be sports like a basketball or a less necessary one where GA swoops in and fills the void. You know, kids didn't discover basketball at summer camp this year or whatever, and so GA has taken its place. Swimming, you'd be hopeful for but maybe the basketballs or the badmintons or those uh, lesser indoor sports could struggle, Grania. I don't know what your take is. Absolutely, and, and she mentions as well that it is a life skill, and I have three kids myself, and we were just about to start doing swimming lessons, and I will definitely be back doing swimming lessons yeah. straight away as the pool's open because it is a life skill. Like You need to be able to, to, to do it. But a big thing as well, and, and it's interesting, there's just an increasing frustration that the industry is just not being considered anywhere. No one is talking about us. And that's really, that's very, very difficult if you're in charge or you're involved in the sport. Like there's 25 indoor sports and, and it's true. No one is really talking about them. There's this perception, oh, well, GEA, outdoor golf, everything's back next week. So sport's back. And it's not. And I think it's just them, it's just them trying to, to get more, um, I, su I suppose, a schedule, a time scale, like when are we going to go back? It's not as simple. And, and swimming itself, it's safe. It's everything around us. It's the dressing room that's trying to get out and, and get everybody in and out safely. But I do, I definitely believe there'll be a massive upsurge going back. I know I can only speak for myself um, and I have a friend who went religiously swimming every single morning before work. She cannot wait to get back to a swimming pool as well. So I do think people will go back to it, but it's just, we need to start hearing the conversation. They need to be included in the conversation of sport, all indoor sports, of when they're going to actually get back, mm. which I know is difficult. It's really difficult with COVID, uh, the timelines, et cetera. But I think there needs to start to be conversation and an awareness that these sports do exist outside of the big three and that people do want to get back to playing these sports. That's very encouraging about the chlorine killing the COVID after however Huge, many seconds. Yeah. I guess the changing rooms is the concern, but still, that's that's good news. Now, I knew Kieran Cunningham would be all over this next story. Dennis Walsh, page 17 of the Sunday Times, the GEA broadcast rights a year out from it, the wheeling, the dealing, the politics, the money. I saw this, I was like, yeah, Cunningham will be all over this. And uh, Julie, the, Ted, the WhatsApp came in, and uh, there it was. So, look, we're at an interesting point in TV <laughs> rights. We're at an interesting point in TV rights, Kieran, because obviously the um, the digital Amazons of the world are swirling around for the first time in a very real way, you would think. And the rights for a lot of things are just up at the moment. Six Nations being yeah. negotiated. And the GA deal is 12 months uh, to run. Dennis Walsh right in here saying that uh, none of the broadcasters have yet received an email from Crow Park. And obviously Air Sport and their involvement uh, leaves a bit of a vacuum, as in they're uh, walking off the pitch in midsummer, as Dennis says, leaving behind the rights to Saturday night National League matches. And in theory, the 30 club games they abandoned uh, a couple of years ago. And then, well, you can pick it up from here. What's what's catching your eye here? What's the, what's well, the point of this see, there's piece? There's a few interesting things. Well, well one, one thing you didn't mention is that uh, they're saying the likelihood a news talk are going to be back bidding for... Or GA Championship games. News to, me. News to me. News to me. I'll be the last to know. Don't you worry. Okay. No, but one of the interesting things, they said, uh, Dennis, said, the word of the grapevine is that RT are going to pro 14 rugby. So he's raising the issue if, you know, uh, because they are losing these league games, uh, how would RT, would RT actually be, you know, would it be possible for them to show pro 14 and league games? It would, it would create logistical difficulties and scheduling difficulties and, you know, I, I don't think it would be uh, it would be on the cards. So you know, because the last had, the last couple of years, RTE obviously lost the Six Nations and didn't have Pro 14. They filled that spring, I suppose, gap from their point of view over the last couple of years by taking a couple of high profile National League games from Air, uh, who sub licensed them to RTE. Yeah. Dublin Kerry one yeah. night did did huge numbers, that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. your your point is, yeah. if RTE suddenly have Pro 14 every week, who who shows yeah, the league yeah. games? Maybe they do both. I don't know. Well, see, because Air, Air won't be able to show them uh, TG Car of the Sunday rights. So who gets the Saturday rights? So, you know, and, and like you do, you obviously do work, some work for Virgin, Joe. And uh, Dennis brings up Virgin because Dennis, uh, Virgin are losing Six Nations. They're losing Champions League. So, you know, would they be, 
you know, would this be a way better to stay in with a live sport now for Virgin? It might well be. Um, well, I, I, to be know, fair, I don't know. We don't know yet what's happening with Six Nations. We know certainly it's been contested again, but Virgin are back in contesting forward to the best of my knowledge. But we don't. We don't know what's okay, happening there. Sorry. Yeah, I, I thought RT uh, were in the, in the front. They, in the front seat, but they, they may well be. They may well be. They yeah. may well be. Okay, but it, it, you know that it's. Like, like it's only a few years ago since so the Sky deal was, in, and the RT took a lot of flack, or the GA took quite a bit of flack over that. But now it does seem like it will be spread even further. Like Amazon might be a player. Who knows? You know, because these these kind of things are changing all the time. Like, because the amount of county boards that streamed games last year, and I think that quite quite a few counties wouldn't mind taking it over themselves. Like the, the Donegal County Board or the Armagh or the Mayo, whatever, that they show their games, and mm. then you know that the, the, they're allowed to cut their own deals. And take the own, the, make their own money out of it. So I don't know if that can ever be a factor, but I think there might come pressure on the GA to to allow that at some stage. Yeah, with the new split season, uh, writes Dennis, expected to start next year. There will not be any inter county matches between the end of July and the end of January each year. The GA simply cannot afford for its games to disappear from RT screens for six months. Hence, he's talking about club games, etc. Look, let's put this to bed. We have a hotline here to Sky Sports, TG Car, and RTE, who's going to clear up what's going on. I'm a bit like you, Joe. I'd be the last to hear everything as well. Um, just telling you it's happening or not. But one thing that's not mentioned there is, is live streaming. I think that's going to be a massive role in the upcoming in a contract as well. Um, and live streaming, when you're streaming games, is actually a lot cheaper to do than it is to actually send a, a, an OB to it and do a full um, live broadcast that what we'd be used to for the the Pro 14 games, for the GEA matches, um, etc. So I think that's going to have a big contract role as well because... RT could easily, if they get the contract to do cha- um, cha- or if the rugby, they could also do the National League as well if they get stuff on that. And you have stuff that could be an RTE player. Mm. Um, TG Cahar, I know, do that. They have a YouTube channel. They have um, tgcahar.ie as well. And then they have a live OB. And I think consumers, particularly of a younger age, are actually more used to watching stuff on screens now, mm. um, on their phone, on their tablet, whatever, um, iPad, than actually traditional television. So that hasn't been mentioned, but I think that would be a big player um, and a streaming contract of who they do that. I don't think the GA will go down the road of giving individual counties a um, chance to do this, except maybe if none of the broadcasters or nobody else can put this in, in to bed, because the reason is they want to standardise look to their actual championship, to their actual league, right? So they need you need your graphics, you need your... Your, your slickness that you would have. So maybe there will be there'll be an overall contract and you'd have little, a smaller contractors brought in to actually do that as part of a GEA package. This could be a way for the GEA to actually say, you know what, we want to be in control of this. Maybe they're thinking of a GEA TV down the line. We want to be in control of this. We'll actually organise a company or a broadcast company to be in charge of this. And then they individually will look um, at, different, at different counties and actually standardise this for us. So that could be something as well going down the road to see how that goes. Um, so I, I do think there's more flexibility now for broadcasters to show lots of different sport at the same time because consumers are changing their habits of how they watch sport. Yeah. It's not the traditional way of television. Oh no, um, it's all it's all changing. I mean, yeah. Virgin losing Champions League is a great pity. They were doing a brilliant job on it, but yeah. we still don't actually know who's taken the Champions League. You know, it's amazing. Have, yeah. it's, it's a pretty yeah. leaky industry, as you can imagine. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's, it employs uh, gossipers by nature and uh, we still don't quite know where the Champions League is going next year on Irish TV or will it be on TV probably not at this stage mm. so uh, there we are it's all in flux at the moment between Six Nations and Pro 16 as it will be and the GEA contract next year so it's just one of those phases where it's all up in the air there's everybody running around and it'll settle down for another three or four year yeah, cycle but, but I suppose I- but what I do want to say is our sport. I mean, I'm I'm really sorry for the individuals that are working there. I, I don't know the situation. I, I know a few of the guys personally from working with them, and yeah. I would have did a bit of work with our sport as well. And you know, they're great people, hugely involved and, and passionate about sport. And it's a really tough time when those contracts come to men. You've lost your job. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Again, I haven't spoken personally to any of them, so I'm not sure if there's another role that they'll be getting involved in. But it is a tough time when a contract comes to the end and you're working in a particular organisation and they decide they they lose. Champs that possibly could be happening. Virgin Media as well, Joe, that people just lose their jobs and it's hard to know what else is in store. So I'm just thinking of those people as well because it is a, it is a tough time when you lose rights and you won't be involved in, in that company or in, in the broadcast of that for the near future. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And I'm not talking about any specific channel. I don't know what's going on at any macro level really, but mm. 
just that horrible flux of three and four year rights deals and then you know even 18 months in people are worried well what's happening and have you heard and where are we I mean it's a constant approach to a cliff I and mean, I think you probably only only enjoy year one of the rights almost it's that kind of an industry mm-hmm. yeah exactly because you just don't know yeah. you know nobody knows and 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 to be fair I think the year as well the GA are only getting around to probably sorting this out now as well and it is quite late in the year usually around this time you'd nearly know before the championship begins who has got the contracts for the next four or five years and again we don't even know how long the contract will be for the GA will it be five years will they do a seven year deal will they do a three year deal you know possibly I would imagine five years but who knows you know things are changing but I definitely see the landscape changing in terms of what they're going to be looking for from broadcasters in the next contract Mm, okay well we'll come back to it I'm sure over the coming months COVID delayed negotiations on certain fronts like Six Nations would usually be done by now but so that's been delayed, so it's a real conversion. So rights being organised at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, Katie Taylor versus an MTK opponent, page uh, sixty-one of the Mail. Kieran, I know it's probably been mentioned elsewhere. Yeah, but, so you've been. Yeah, there's on... a little bit. Uh, Sean McGold, there's a little bit of this on the end as goes, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A, I wrote a piece about this yesterday as well. In that, um, look, she's sitting like. Katie Taylor's comfortably one of the most popular Irish sports people ever. Like, uh, you know, the most, in that annual survey by Tenio that they carry out every year, she's been voted the most admired sports star in Ireland for the uh, for the last four years in a row. Yeah. And I think six of the last eight or something. But this is the first time she's coming up against an MTK fighter. And the piece I did yesterday, I was just looking into the connections within Irish sport, and everybody, really, there's only one degree of separation between virtually everybody. It's a tiny world and MTK. Mm. And it's kind of difficult. Um, uh, not not of any involvement at some stage. Like, like next to the common piece by Mark Geller in the, in, in, the, um, in the mail, he has an interview with Shannon Courtney, a female, English female boxer with Irish roots. But in that, it's mentioned that she's... Um, trained by Adam Booth, you know, who, who coached Andy Lee and Ryan Burnett. And Adam Booth now uh, works for MTK. Andy Lee trains Tyson Fury for MTK. So, so there's connections everywhere. You know, the argument Mark makes there is that Katie has, Katie Taylor has the clout that she could have turned this down. She didn't have to take this fight. But I think that, you know, there would have been pressure from Eddie Hearn and from broadcaster and from management, etc., that this is a glamour fight, you know, because Natasha Jonas... Is a big name in the UK. You know they fought to, they fought against each other at the Olympics nine years ago, but um, like the fight couldn't take place here because you know even even without COVID because of security risks around MTK and fears. You know the Guardian just won't allow big fights here involving MTK. So it's 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 a difficult one for for Katie because Katie Taylor always makes great play of her integrity, and I think she means that. And I don't think she would have. Uh, no, I don't think she has any time for, you know, she could have advertised to MTK herself if she wanted. She could have, been, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if she had money thrown at her and she's never got involved in it. But, you know, this is one of the few times she's been in the spotlight for anything remotely negative. Like, it's not, it's not her fault, obviously, but it's just MTK does, is a toxic brand now. Yeah, it does seem like it's very hard to avoid totally across the course of your career. The headline on Mark Aller's piece is MTK Association casts a shadow over Taylor's clash with Jonas. The, the the conclusion is if next Saturday is to be Taylor's final time inside a ring on this side of the Atlantic, it will leave a pretty sour taste that the bout will be showcasing MTK Global and sports washing this toxic brand is what Mark says. And as you said, Karen, he argues Taylor's leverage is such that she could have refused uh, this bout. It's very difficult. I mean, it's difficult to avoid MTK totally and conduct your career in a way that um, you know serves your own interests as well I don't know I, I, I don't really hold it against her perfectly personally I think it's it's you know she can only look after herself and how she does her own business and you, you start turning down fights legitimate fights like that where does that end you know yeah and ultimately yeah like it's a dangerous business you're offered money I would say to fight Jonah she's, she's been offered a significant amount of money and that's the bottom line for boxers. Like, in a way, I don't judge the boxers and trainers overly much in this. Like, I would look more like at managers, promoters, and TV companies yeah. and the regular regularity bodies in relation yeah. to, to MTK. Yeah, I would as well, to be honest. Um, 
Sarah Lavin in the Sunday Independent. Very good interview, this, Gronje. Yeah, it was really good. I really enjoyed it. Who, um, is, who is Sarah Lavin, for people who may not so realise? Sarah Lavin was touted as the next girl of her work. Um, so, and it's interesting, it starts the article um, written by Sean McGoldick that they share the same birthday on May the 28th. Um, so, um, by the age, by the 20 year old when she in 2014, Lavin had already won a silver medal in the 100 metre hurdles at the European Junior Championship. So it just it chronicles her career, like everyone was just looking at her at this age as, as the next Derville work, and she was going to be the next world-class hurdle, hurdler, and then fate intervened. And it just goes through just the horrific injuries that she, she, that she encountered. So just competing at Rio Olympics were shattered. She was diagnosed with a stretch factor in her foot, which required her to wear a boot for 16 weeks. And she watched the heats of the 100-meter hurdles at the Games while exercising in a leg extension machine in the University of Limerick gym. Then four, roll on four years later for the Tokyo Olympics last year, then she sustained a serious ankle injury in a freak accident after a race in Holland. So she, it suited her that the Games had been postponed, so she's fully convinced that the Games will go ahead. But what I found really interesting, Joe, as well, and, you know, we're talking about elite athletes, and she is an elite athlete. Like, we, we hope that she will get to the Olympics. She hasn't got her time yet to get to the Olympics, but we're hoping that she will. Mm. But she's a self-employed physiotherapist in her native Limerick, and she hasn't worked since January, as she's focusing on qualifying for Tokyo. But even though she's a full-time athlete, she must support herself, as she's not funded by Sport Ireland. She says, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Being completely honest, it's very difficult financially to be involved in Olympic sport, particularly now. It costs a lot of money to be a high-performance athlete. She says, I don't want to sound like a cribbler or a moaner, but this is not who I am, but it costs so much money. Look at any other sport, whether it's in the Premier League or even Gaelic football or hurling, the teams with the money do really well. Unfortunately, in every aspect of life, money talks. So I just think that's extraordinary. You know, we're expecting athletes to compete and, you know, we'll all be there cheering her on if she makes the time and gets to the, gets to Tokyo. Yet she's doing it by herself. She's absolutely, you know, funding mm. to do that. Mm. And, you, you know, it's, it's you know, we expect so much from athletes. Like in, in GAA terms, that wouldn't even happen. Like you'd have some sponsors coming in. Now maybe she has sponsored. I didn't see that in the piece, but maybe she has some sponsors that would help. But I'm sure it's not a massive amount that she's getting. But in terms of GA, you'd get your sponsored car, maybe your sponsored phone. Your, you know, you, you go to different functions and uh, and you go on chat shows or whatever. You get a, a bit of money. So, but for her to actually be training as a full time athlete, having to give up her job in January to pursue her dream of actually making the Olympic Games, and she's not getting any funding at all. So I found that really, really disappointing for her. And I just think that's very, very unfair, and um, that we expect so much from our athletes and they don't get any funding to do that. Yeah, no, it's a fair point. The Olympians in particular, you never know. Who, I, I, you always have to check who's getting funding, who's not, and uh, she's not, so she's trying to juggle everything, which is very difficult. I mean, it is amazing. So she misses the Rio Olympics with that stress fracture, and then she's about to miss Tokyo with an ankle injury, and suddenly she gets this yeah. reprieve. So basically... So you're really, she, you're really hoping that she does Yeah, it. She's, <laughs> she's ranked 42nd in the world. Now, you can get into the Olympics if you're into the top 40. So she's so close. She's ranked 42nd in the world. She can get in if she's ranked top 40 or if she hits the qualification standard mm. time. And so she's got races coming up over the next six weeks to um, try and make it. So fingers crossed she does. Quite interesting as well. I think it's great that this has been talked about openly and, and she's comfortable talking about it. She missed Rio because of a stress fracture. And basically what had happened there, a combination of overtraining and undereating resulted in her developing a condition called relative energy deficiency in sport. As that was the reason she had the stress uh, fracture yeah. and she didn't recognise she was an, in any danger herself even though she had gone 10 months without having a period. She said, there was never a point when my family or friends were worried significantly about my health but as an athlete you have to take on a certain amount of fuel. So uh, eventually um, they got it sorted out thankfully but uh, kind of interesting one that as well that she didn't see any it, warning signs there. I know lots exactly. of athletes obviously are in the sa similar boat. Yeah, and it's great that she's speaking about this because this could actually help somebody else reading this going, yeah. gosh, maybe that's something that's happening to me. But also as well, the pandemic has really affected her um, participation, like the cancellation of both the Cork City Sports and the Morton Mile meetings due to COVID-19 restriction means that she will have to travel abroad to race. So that's tough too, you know, that's extra cost, extra et cetera, rather than being in, in two meets here that actually could have helped her in her qualification and making the Olympics. Yeah. The uh, Irish team yesterday played Italy. Um, so the back page of the mail, much more like it. It was Ireland 25, Italy 5. I thought to be fair, Brennan Fanning hit the nail on the head. Uh, poor affair is uh, 
decorated by Silken Scores. And the scores were good and Murphy Crow took her tries especially well, but it was, as Brennan Fanning says, an error-strewn first half in particular, and it, it was. It wasn't a great spectacle by any means. Good conditions for rugby. We just didn't see it. It was just very, very stop-start and never got going and just not a great spectacle, to be honest, um, one of those days. But uh, Brennan Fanning takes up the mantle here, Kieran. I are a few hiding away from the critical questions. Um, in short here, Adam Griggs was at a press conference earlier in the week and he was asked who specifically is running the Women's All-Ireland League and the Interprovincial Series. And his answer was, I know that we are running it as a body, but if you're looking for names, I'm, I'm unable to give you the names of who is running it. Uh, this yeah. was obviously seized upon as not great, given he's the head coach of the Irish women's team. And you would think effectively the, these are the two channels all his players are coming to him through. And then uh, he clarified it at a, a later date and, and gave some of the names involved. But um, Brennan Fanning kind of picked up that point and took it as indicative maybe of where the IRFU is falling short in its strategic plan 2018 to 2023 when it comes to the women's game. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, I don't think the women's uh, Ireland women's rugby team has ever got as much coverage as over the last month, and it's, it's because normally the the women's Six Nation runs against, well, nice. is on the same time as Six Nations, so it gets swamped. But this time, you know, it's got huge TV coverage, it's got a lot of coverage across all media, and but the, they've shot themselves in the foot, the IRFU, over some of the stuff that's going on. Like Adam Griggs was effectively, I think, hung out to dry on this. Like uh, he should. Uh, and also, you know, a decision was made that only only one player was put forward before the media this week, I think, and that was at the captain's run, which, you know, when, when they talk so much about wanting to promote the sport, you know, and get more coverage for the women's game, it just it, it beggars belief, you know, and they have been pushing it very hard in their own social media channels, et cetera, as well, the, the women's six nations, it's very hard to figure out what they're at. But, you know, uh, Brandon asked questions, like he said, they might ask there, if you might ask something like, how do you uh, lads actually settle on your targets? How do you pitch your women's Six Nation performance over the period of the plan at one title win, along with consistent top three finishes, as well as World Cup qualification featuring a top six finish? We can only infer that the union considered less damaging to leave Greg swinging in the wind than open the door to more questions. Otherwise, someone might ask for an explanation on how the plan is put together and who crunches the number numbers you know and what is the you know what is the plan for women's rugby you know what is david nucifora's uh input on this you know brendan points out that you know nucifora now and then makes his version of the queen's speech you know he makes a state of the nation address disappears doesn't take questions effectively turns his phone off as brendan puts it you know and there just doesn't seem to be uh you know where is the leadership in this you just wonder mm. Well, Anthony and Eddie is the RFU director of women's rugby. Like I'm not even, like Dave Nusavor looks after the professional game, and so therefore the extent to which he's involved here isn't clear. But uh, Brennan makes the point that maybe it would have been a good week for Eddie to come out and host a conference himself and say, right, we're all we have been over the last number of weeks talking about the fact that the Irish women are amateur and they're going up against you know professionals in England and semi-professionals in France. There's been a lot of talk the last couple of weeks about a roadmap and where are we going and then Adam Griggs was caught a bit short at that press conference and it might have been a good time, says Brennan, to almost open the doors and say, here's where we are, here's what we're thinking. Maybe that'll happen in due course, to be fair. Because, um, you know, look, geez, on, on you know the performance yesterday, one, they did win, so it's far, you know, far, far from a disaster. They finished third in the Six Nations and that's three weeks on the bounce now. Even in GAA, you see amateurs find three weeks on the bounce. That third week, there's often a real dip in performance. It can be tricky. And like there's players there who are working on the front line. So for all we know, they're doing 12-hour shifts across the week and then trying to play for their country. So it's not easy and there are mitigating circumstances and they did win the game. But um, I think, Grania, that sense of where is the women's game going in mm -hmm. this country has really um, boiled up over the last couple of weeks and it might be a good time for the IRFU to come out and say well here's the plan here's the roadmap here's the roadmap towards professionalism in how many number of years or here's professionalism as we see it etc because you know if, if Adam Griggs wasn't entirely sure who was really charging, charged with the AIL and the Interpros then it's no surprise that the rest of us don't see a kind of clear vision as such 
Well, in, in a way, like, it actually was a good thing that he was like that because it actually, look, the amount of talking that we're doing about it and where is the game going and who is in charge and why aren't we hearing from all these people that are supposed to be in charge of it? So I think it's a positive in, in one way that we're now talking about it. But as you rightly said, we need to find out what's happening. Where is it going and what is the plan? You know, if you want Ireland to be involved and be successfully involved in the next 10 years, um, so are we going to be happy that we finish third in every Six Nations competition or is there a serious endeavour there to get Ireland to um, winning the Six Nations? Well, the aim, sorry, you know, the aim is yeah. that they'll have lots of third place finishes, but that they'll win one Six Nations and get to the World Cup and have a top six finish. That's in the strategic plan 2018 to 2023. But I mean, they're not very close to winning the Six Nations at the moment. No, they're not. And it's a very small time scale when you're coming from where we are at in terms of grassroots. So what I would love to hear is just somebody in the top brass to come out and, and, and spell out over. It's, it's a 10 year plan as well, Joe. Like, you know, things take time. So you need to be looking at a 10 year plan of what's going to happen by if we start 2020, 2021 by 2031. Where is the game going to be? Are we going to have a semi-professional setup? Are we going to have a professional setup? Who's going to be in charge of at the AIL? Um, stage and, and how are we going to get more girls involved in, in, in playing rugby and I think that's massively important as well and and the media thing that, that disappoints me as well when I don't see more women on front of camera because these are the role models these are the women that we need to hear from and I think it's absolutely brilliant that we've seen all these games on our team and, and credit to them for showing them all. It's been brilliant. So you actually can see this visibility and it's tying into everything that the 20 by 20 campaign was. But if we don't actually hear more for these role models, these are young girls that need to see these people talking and hearing how they got involved. Um, so I, I'm disappointed that there's not more there. Maybe there was a reason. I mean, everyone has full time jobs, but I'm sure... Um, that I suppose if it was properly planned, people were able to take some time off work and do it. it can, it's on Zoom as well. We could have all organised stuff to happen in the evening time, etc. But um, I just think we need to hear more from But We need to hear the plan. And it's a 10-year plan of where we're going. And I think we've heard so many people better qualified than me talking about the plans that need to be put in place. But it's at grassroots. We need to grow the game more. Um, and we need to see that happening. So there's a lot that needs to be done. I think Adam Griggs, not really knowing what was happening, it Sounded terrible, I know, but I think in a one way it's to turn it is actually a positive because it means we're all talking about it and now the media are going to put more pressure, I hope, on the RFU to come out with their plan about where the women's game's going over the next 10 years. Mm. Uh, very finally then, as we uh, really fight the clock here, so we'll, we'll do a uh, too brief a job on this piece with Philip Lanigan talking to Michael Ryan, who's been involved in GEA. He's won 32 All-Ireland titles as a coach uh, from Waterford, has managed... Uh, all levels of the game, all across all aspects of the game. I mean, I was flicking through the mail looking for different pieces and I saw the headline here as a quote from the piece where he says, I dropped my wife one time and there wasn't a word spoken for a week, but she played poorly and that was it. And I thought, OK, I'll stop here. <laughs> uh, I will stop here. And uh, he did drop his wife. I've dropped my sister, I've dropped my daughters, I've dropped my wife. If you were related to me, you were at a disadvantage. I dropped my wife one time and there was no word spoken in the house for a week. I thought she'd played very poorly on the day and that was it. It was back in the mid 80s. Uh, we presume they've got over it. it. Philip writes that Catherine is pottering in another room as he speaks, tells me he has now been forgiven just about. Uh, this is really good. I, I presume you've come across Michael Ryan a good bit, Ronya, TG Carroll yeah, work. Yeah, I have. Michael, Michelle, his daughter, was, is an analyst on, on TG Cahar and brilliant, brilliant footballer for Waterford. But um, a real character, like we'll call a spade a spade. You know, no airs or graces. It'll be straight out with it from, from Michael. But um, has done so much for a game for hurling and for football and and Bally Mack, like I mean you can put that success down to him and his involvement and getting involved in it. I thought that was hilarious actually about about his wife and that if you were related to me, um, you're at a disadvantage. But one thing that I found that I didn't realise that he was um, a table quiz specialist and an extended part of a crew that won RT's primetime show Where in the World in, in 1990, mm -hmm. along with good a good friend and Waterford football figurehead John Jackson Kiley. So I think very passionate, I, and he, he does an awful lot for the ladies' game. He's done an awful lot for the ladies' game. He's very passionate about it, has been involved from the very beginning, um, Joe, as well, like when not many people wanted to get involved in ladies' football or promoted, and he's been one of the main promoters of, of, of women's football in Waterford, and you can see in his daughters as well that they how passionate they are and, and 
and the days that they've played with Waterford too. And of course, he's been involved in all Ireland teams as well. But he also has was in, was in charge of the Waterford hurlers and and Westmeath hurling, and it and it didn't end well in, in the Waterford hurlers. And I, I'd say he was quite hurt, as anyone is, and disappointed mm. with the way that ended. But I thought, which was really testament to his character as well. Like one of the players asked him and phoned him and said, "Look, will you come on on the trip abroad with us?" I think was it to Tenerife for going on a team holiday. Uh, as to Tenerife to Team Holland, he was kind of going, sure, what would the new manager think of this? And Joe Quaid had come in and, and, re- and replaced him. Um, he was saying, um, oh, what's your luck? We'd love you to come. And off he went to that. Um, that, was so after, he just, that was after his four years with the Westmead Hurlers. That was after four years with yeah. Westmead, sorry, Hurlers. Yeah, so I thought that was really nice. Like, you know, that, well, the players still thought an awful lot of him. Um, and at the same time, he still wanted to get involved and get back to Westmead, and, and sorry, and, and to go on the holidays and and, and have have fun with the lads as well. So he's given a lot to her, and he's given a lot to ladies football, um, and a real character. And I haven't read his book yet, but I really must re- read it. But another thing as well, just very quickly, I know times against us, but um, he isn't in favour of the ladies Gaelic um, association merging with the GEA, which I think is interesting. But there's been a lot of calls for people saying that it all should be amalgamated and. His point is that there needs to be more money um, grant split um, between the GPA and um, the LGV. They need to get more money, the women's GPA, and and that those in charge of the LGV are doing a really good job. Um, so what I'd like to see is more government funding for women's sport, not just ladies' football, but camogie, women's soccer. There are so many women playing sport today that deserve a better share of the funding, Ryan added. So it was a really good article, very worth very worthwhile reading. Yeah, he's 65 now, still... Still going strong, still coaching. So, um, and it was nice. I mean, when he left the Westmead job, I know the Waterford job ended badly. It, there was that brilliant game against Kilkenny, the extra time game, and he, there was a sense the players were agitating against him, and so he jumped rather than uh, being pushed. But the Westmead team, he did four years with them, and they got him a plaque at the end of his four years saying, Thank you for all you've brought to our country. Mm. Your hard work, commitment, desire has shaped our character as men and still great belief within us. Four special years that will long be remembered. Westmead Hurling's been brought to a better place we wish you all the best in the future and will always be forever grateful I mean I, I, Kieran, that's uh, G- everything good about the GAA there isn't it and uh, no, absolutely nice but, touch you know, by the Westmead you know team deser- yeah, you know who deserves credit for this as well as Liam Hayes because Liam Hayes is behind Hero Books yeah and ordinarily you wouldn't have an autobiography by Michael Ryan on the bookshelves because you know the big publishers look at the Brian O'Driscoll's or Kieran Donahue's, whoever they look at uh, big names on a national level, and even though he'd achieved much on a national level, most publishers wouldn't think his book would sell. Yeah, Hayes's model is to go think local. So, like John Callanan and Claire is a book out at the moment who, who played hurling for Claire in the 70s, who's a great player. Michael Ryan is another one. So, he picks people, he just thinks, you know, within say Waterford, 5,000 people might want to buy this. You know, outside Waterford, maybe another 500 or whatever. So we'll go with it. And because of that, we get some great stories out and some books that wouldn't ordinarily be published. And I think fair play to him for doing that. It's a great a great, a great, a great, way of doing it, something different. Yeah, agreed. Guys, thanks so much. Kieran Cunningham, Grania McElwain, appreciate it. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball.